All right, so I still got approximately 30 seconds before we officially begin. I love that you just went through that uh, little bit of introductions of uh, who's in the audience today. I, it is not hyperbole. I'm not trying to falsely win all of you over as she was reading what you were doing. I got a little one uh, proud that I'm I'm lucky enough to present to you all, and I'll tell you why in a second. Um, but like just hearing all the work, all of you that were kind enough to reply um, are doing, I, I got a little emotional. Um, it's really, really cool to work with nonprofits. Um, I just I just adore that so many people are doing such great things around the world. And with that, one o'clock, so let's go ahead and get started. Hey, everybody. Welcome to How to Own the Smartphone with Social, Email, and Text. Call attention to what you see on the slide there. Aretha did mention at the top, we are recording today's webinar. We're going to copy the recording out to all of you. Keep your questions coming in through the question little tab there or through the chat. I've got Heather behind the scenes from Constant Contact who is going to um, answer questions that can be immediately answered that are maybe specific to you. Um, and she's also going to collate some questions to read to me at the end. So keep your questions coming throughout. Let's go ahead and talk about what we think the top challenges to nonprofits are. And this is actually very, probably pretty familiar to you because you would probably identify the challenges that your organization is similar to these. What nonprofits typically say is that they, a uh, big challenge, number one challenge is finding new donors, new stakeholders, volunteers, employees, um, getting, getting connections to the media, et cetera, et cetera. Finding these new people is the most critical thing. It's the top challenge for a nonprofit. Number two is time crunch, right? Small staffed, um, maybe wearing multiple hats. Uh, this is very, very commonly told to us by nonprofits is the second biggest challenge. Third biggest challenge is making sure that they're retaining and, and connecting and committing to existing stakeholders, existing volunteers, existing donors, existing stakeholders, making sure that they're connected. What I'm gonna suggest to you and what the real purpose of today's presentation is, is to flip all of that upside down. What we suggest, a nonprofit organization pay attention to is number one, retaining existing stakeholders. Number two, finding new donors, new stakeholders. And number three, conquering that time challenge. Keep in mind that gaining a new donor can be five to 25 times more expensive than retaining an existing one. Do you need to keep the donor pipeline uh, full? Yes, you need to have new donors constantly coming in, but you need to make sure you're paying attention to people that have donated to you, that have connected to you, that are volunteering for you, keeping people connected to you is going to be really critical and it's going to help you save time in the sense that you're not constantly having to chase that new uh, um, stakeholder uh, because you're committing time to the existing. 99% of consumers check their personal email at least once a day and what devices they check that on. That's why you're here, the smartphone. Aretha said, you know, that's a smartphone world. Most people read emails on a smartphone. And I want to challenge you after today's webinar. Now, I know just for a fact that some of you are multitasking. Some of you probably have your phone in your hand. So do or do not do this right now. But I challenge all of you post-webinar to think through what the most used app is on your phone. Now, this is a live presentation. I'd be able to ask you and you'd reply back, oh, Snapchat, oh, uh, uh, Facebook, Instagram, Google Maps. Uh, I'm going to say, pay attention. You're probably using your email app more than any other app on your device. Now, it's funny because we don't think of our email app, and I'm talking about Gmail or Outlook, whatever you use to read email. We don't think of that app as an app. We think of it as a utility. It is so ubiquitous and something we're in so often that it doesn't necessarily feel like a specific app experience like Facebook or Instagram. No, it feels more like a utility, like, well, of course I'm checking my email. That's the must do. Well, guess who else is treating? their email inbox is a, a utility, as a must do all the time, every time. Your future donors, your existing donors, your future stakeholders, your existing stakeholders, your constituency, they're on their mobile device, they're reading email on the phone. We live, duh, right Matt, in a smartphone world. So we're gonna take this idea of retaining existing stakeholders, finding new donors and stakeholders and saving you time. And we're gonna distill it down into the smartphone world. So what will we cover today? how social email and text move people closer to your goals, how to harness the strengths of each channel and how to create an overall great experience. Now I said at the top, right before I officially began that you your little stories about what you do for the world moved me and I felt very honored to present to you. Why? Because I've been there. So preceding my 12 years at Constant Contact, I worked at a 5013C. 
I worked for a nonprofit for about four years, and I can tell you I've never worked harder in my life <laughs> for less money. Um, so I do understand uh, what it's like. Our organization was a staff of two. Uh, I had to be the receptionist, the bookkeeper, the marketing director. I had to uh, do procurement. I had to do uh, member relations. So I know what it's like to have passion for an organization and what kept me at that organization, even though I didn't make much income. What kept me there for that long? Passion. I was passionate about what we did and what we supported. And I know just even by the way you responded to uh, Aretha's questions that you're passionate about what you're doing. And so I'm really honored and thrilled to present this information to you today. My name is Matthew Montoya, Senior Channel Marketing and Enablement uh, uh, Manager at Constant Contact. Fancy word just means I have been training. I'm a teacher for Constant Contact for 12 years. And let's go ahead and teach you some things today. So let's start with how social email and text move people closer to your goals. So I'd go out on a limb and say, some of you are doing email marketing, probably most of you are doing social media marketing. Maybe some of you are dipping your toe into text. Maybe some of you are doing them all and you're here today to learn to be more efficient or some ideas uh, to help you uh, get more results. But I doubt many of you are doing all three. Why? Well, that can be really overwhelming. You may be challenged to find time to do just one of them. And the idea of doing social media and email, social media and email and texting, it might feel too much. Well, what we encourage you to do at Constant Contact is practice the party principle. You want to think of social media as the big party, great for engaging large groups of people, meeting new people, connecting to them. So then later, as you identify and uh, you identify yourself with them and they identify your, uh, themselves with you, they move into email. Email's the after party. You found the people to build deeper relationships with. They now have a deeper connection to you. They say, yes, I want to stay connected to you. And that's what email marketing is. Lastly, texting is the VIP party. These are people you really want to treat very special because you connect to them in the most personal place on their smartphone via text. So you want to harness the strengths of each of these channels. Social media, that's great for sharing uh, beyond email and SMS. It's a way to engage people and reach a new audience. Now, one thing to be aware of with social media, if you've put all of your eggs in the social media basket, let me pause for a second. I use social media as a marketer, constant contact those social media tools. I do not mean to throw social media under the bus here. It's a fantastic and ubiquitous tool, right? But just because somebody's connected to you on social media, if you've put all of your eggs in the social media basket, you may not be reaching the audience you think you are. Why is that? Well, because social media has algorithms, meaning sometimes they show your content and sometimes they don't. So one quick way around that is to make sure you're engaging your audience. You want people to like your comments, comment on your comments, react to your comments, share your comments, share your articles, share your pieces. That's one way to get around the algorithms. But you really shouldn't put all your eggs in this basket because it's a fantastic way to quickly connect to people. But generally on social uh, social media, people aren't as engaged with you. That's where you get to the after party, email. This reaches the audience directly. And we think about it. When you gain a new subscriber, meaning they have given you their email address in order to send them email marketing, there is an inherent deeper relationship occurring there. They're basically saying, yes, I want to learn more from you, learn more about you, perhaps spend time with you, perhaps spend money with you. This may be the first real yes in your relationship. And so we want to make sure that we're treating this audience a little more sp uh, special than the social media audience because they're making a commit to us. You can send more robust messages to provide more detail. Email marketing is fantastic for keeping your organization top of mind repeatedly sending out email information that's motivating people to slowly make the connection to what you do and how they can participate in it. Lastly, the VIP party. SMS is obviously great for sending short messages that are time sensitive. You don't want to employ SMS in terms of building long-term relationships the way email does or finding new relationships the way social media does. SMS is really fantastic for motiv motivating people with information that is time sensitive. The way I, I see most nonprofits utilize SMS is for event notifications. So somebody uh, registers for an event, you say, uh, you know, a week out for the event, the events on uh, this date, you share a link with more information about what the attendee needs to know. And then an hour before, if it's a webinar, you send them a reminder. That's a great way to leverage this powerful tool. But it is a powerful tool and you don't want to overuse it. So we're going to break all of these up and talk about some best practices and some ideas for social media, email, and texting. So let's start with social media. That's the party, right? So 
this probably is a duh moment, but word of mouth obviously nowadays mostly happens online. It happens anytime someone shares, uh, anybody reviews, shares, mentions, recommends, or connects to your nonprofit in some way. Now on the screen, we can see some examples of just how this can happen on social media. Sharing content, information, recommendations uh, from people that say they're interested in it because they shared it. Now, your nonprofit has an opportunity to be more a, a part of those conversations to increase the chances of someone recommending you or seeking you out when they want to connect to you in a deeper way. So, social media. I kind of feel like this is a little bit old hat. Ideally, you've been in um, you've been an organization long enough that you're probably dabbling your toe, if not fully committing your whole foot into the social media world. But what I do know from my time of meeting so many social media, and I didn't even uh, social media, so many nonprofits. I didn't even say this at the introduction. Um, in my 12 years of constant contact, I've had the opportunity to meet over 12,000 small businesses and nonprofits. I've met a lot of nonprofits in my time in person. And one thing I have learned when it comes to social media is that nonprofits will sometimes, I'm trying to find a nice way to say this, gravitate towards one social media platform when they may want to look at others as well. Generally, that's going to be Facebook. And obviously, Facebook is really powerful. But you do need to make sure that you're broadening your message across different social media channels based on what you're trying to achieve and based on what kind of nonprofit you are. So Facebook obviously is great, but you are competing with a lot of noise. There's a lot of communication occurring, both good and bad on Facebook. And you also need to be aware that Facebook, just like all social media channels, own your contacts and kind of own the relationship. And so you need to be aware of that. Obviously, Instagram is highly visual, so some of you will play right into that. So um, the examples we're going to share today, for the most part, are going to be around animal adoption. And obviously, that can be a very visual, uh, uh, a visually appealing way to market an organization. But others may not be as visually inclined in terms of their message doesn't translate as well to visual imagery. Pinterest is another very visual place where you can also not, not only share images, but you can share ideas, these boards that you can have people pin your uh, information to as a way to broaden your exposure to a larger audience. LinkedIn makes a lot of sense for most nonprofits, but not all. I would actually encourage, if you're not already, for you to have a footprint on LinkedIn, regardless of the kind of organization you are and your mission, only as a way to establish connections and networking, right? So, um, uh, uh, donations, obviously, somewhat is also about relationship plays and networking. And so LinkedIn is a fantastic way for you to broaden the network. But I did hear uh, Risa mention that one of you is working in job placements and things like that. Well, obviously, that makes sense in, uh, to be in the LinkedIn space. Twitter, very, very fast, very public news. You are competing with a lot of noise there. My experience with nonprofits is most of you probably don't have items moving so quickly that you need to be uh, uh, committed to Twitter as a mechanism, as a channel to market out to. And then my opinion, uh, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube is generally where most nonprofits uh, see the biggest benefit. So with YouTube, the benefit obviously is it's video based, but one thing I've learned with nonprofits, that I'm going to throw it a generality here, okay? So don't yell at Heather, who's behind the scenes answering your questions. Some of you would want a very polished, very professional video uh, uh, output on YouTube. Not all of you do. And one really compelling thing to remember is that for the most parts, most of you have a very compelling story that can be shared with nothing more than a camera phone recording a video. Now that camera phone could be selfie and you're talking about your mission. That camera phone could be used to interview somebody. That camera could be uh, used to promote and show off your fantastic event. Most of you can probably get away with just camera phone based YouTube content. One thing that we need to think about when we talk about marketing today is that everybody's pressed for time and attention span has been squashed thanks to smartphones. People don't read content as much as they used to, and they certainly don't read it as deeply as they used to. We generally scan, we generally skim. So if an image uh, speaks a thousand words, we're able to convey more information through imagery. Well, if we think about video, a video speaks a thousand images. So don't feel overwhelmed to dip your toe into YouTube. One thing we do encourage you to do though, is that if you are going to try a cross-channel approach across different social media, you wanna modify your message for each channel. So we can see here Netflix, which we use as an example because most of you are probably familiar with what Netflix does. Obviously not a nonprofit, but they are applying this idea of sharing messages in different ways. So with 
LinkedIn on the left, they have a much more um, article-based, thought leadership-based piece um, that, that uh, resonates in the LinkedIn world, where on the right, with, uh, with Instagram, they have, or Facebook, they have an article that's a little more lighthearted, right? So for you, what I make sure you do is make sure you're altering things like um, your imagery, altering things like your hashtags, altering things like the actual message, and even maybe the content. One thing I do see in the nonprofit space, and this is usually used because of small staffs and limited time, is I will see nonprofits blast the exact same message across multiple social media channels. That is a way to save time, but that may not be a way to get the most donations, the most activity. Remember, our goals should be to retain current members. So we need to make sure that perhaps we're sending messages that would re uh, resonate with that audience. And it can't only be about recruiting new donors, new volunteers. We need to make sure that we're staying connected to our current database. Now, one thing you can employ in social media is on social media, you can encourage them to also follow you in other channels, aka email and text. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. Now, as I said, a lot of nonprofits will post the same message across multiple social media. And when I say the same message, the exact same message. And what we want you to do is focus your time in efforts to revolve around these three goals. Make sure you're spending your time on driving awareness first, making sure that people understand what you do and what you're doing around the world, what you're doing in your community to do whatever it is that you're improving, that, you're, that your mission is, right? You also wanna make sure you're answering questions. So this is another thing I see in the nonprofit space, generally because of small staffs. So if you're going to be on social media, make sure you're consistently and constantly paying attention to what's going on on social media. You don't wanna have questions sit idly by. A couple of reasons why you don't. One is when somebody's engaging you, you want to engage them, right? You're continuing a conversation. That's gonna change the algorithms. That's gonna allow more people to see your posts, it's certainly going to allow that person to see more of your posts and more of your comments. But you also may learn something by that question. So one strategic thing you can do when it comes to social media is learn via the questions you're getting what your audience is most interested in, and then you convert that into content for especially email. If you consistently see a similar question over and over and over again by your constituency, well, that may inform you that, hmm, I probably need to answer this. Now, of course, you're going to answer it in social media, but perhaps you want to answer it with a dedicated page on your website and then have an article in an email that has a little bit of that content that links to that article. Lastly, you want to get them to take what action, right? So one of those actions obviously is going to be donate, but another action can be attend an event, volunteer, and do not forget to ask people to join your mailing list through social media. I'm going to show you how to do that in just a moment. When it comes to content, try repurposing content. So you can on social media, repackage your email content or repackage your blog content. You can also share user-generated content. And one thing, I, a question I've consistently gotten when it comes to email marketing is, well, I don't have time to write all this content. How am I going to come up with all these ideas? Well, you probably have stakeholders, board members, um, volunteers, donors who have a personal story to tell. Have them tell it. Another place to look for uh, content is sister organizations that are in your similar space. You can have them write an article um, for your email or your blog or both. And lastly, don't forget about vendors. Vendors sometimes have really compelling stories to tell um, through social media blogs and email marketing. Just make sure, as I said, you adjust the message to each platform. Now, speaking of each platform, let's pivot to email. E you're gonna use email as that after party to deepen relationships. So the first thing about email marketing, I said it at the beginning, is it's maybe the first yes you're gonna get from a stakeholder, first yes you're gonna get from a potential donor or donor. And so uh, that success, that kind of relationship begins with permission. So you wanna get them to say yes to receiving email. You also wanna have clear opt-in language on signup forms. So you see here an example of a feature in Constant Contact. If you're not using Constant Contact, that's okay, I understand. I would make sure that the tool you're using has this kind of functionality. What you're seeing here is called a lead generation landing page. That's just a bunch of fancy words for an intake form. This form would live on your social media. It would live in a blog. It would live on the signature line of your outgoing Gmail or Outlook emails. Um, this would be something that you would share on print material as a QR code. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. 
The benefit to this form is you can ask your subscribers anything you want, their first name, last name, obviously their email address, but you can also ask them specific questions to your organization. The benefit is that you are getting permission to have people sign up for your, for your email. The reason why that's beneficial is one, tools like constant contact are permission based you have to have permission to email and again we want that opt in we want that behavior we want them to say yes i want this information because that's going to strengthen the relationship whatever you do i don't see this often in the nonprofit space but i have seen it don't buy email lists there are folks out in the universe that will try to sell you an email marketing list right don't buy it reason why, and I'm going to speak to the states, I know we have some friends in Canada on this call today, in the states, it is legal to buy a list. It is legal to use a list. The problem is, is that that cannot, by its nature, be an opt-in. So one, a tool like Constant Contact, and I'll even speak for our competitors, we're going to catch you, um, and you're going to, you're going to not be able to use that list. The reason is, is that a lot of people, if you're emailing people that didn't opt in, they don't know you, how could they possibly know you? And if we take a moment, we think about that. Who sends out email soliciting for behavior, right? In your case, it'd be a donation, be event attendance, soliciting for business to people that don't expect to hear from them. Spammers, right? And so you don't want to act like a spammer. Now, what I do see in the nonprofit space is sister organizations sharing lists. You're kind of like my, uh, your audience is kind of like my audience. My audience is kind of like your audience. Here's my email list. Why don't you send out and all you send out to your email list? You can't do that for the same reason. They didn't expect to hear from you. Now, what you can do with sister organizations is have them email out on your behalf and share a link to your signup page for, on your behalf and vice versa. That is a strategy that is uh, allowed in the States. In Canada, I probably know you've already researched the Canadian anti-spam law. You want to become familiar. Opt-in is the only way in Canada. Um, and buying lists and trading lists is extremely forbidden in, in uh, outside of the States. All right. You also want to segment your list. So I talked to you a moment ago about that, that lead generation landing page is a tool for you to ask people any information you want. Well, if you really want to be effective at email marketing, one of the things you need to do sooner than later, now, if you've been doing email marketing for years, I applaud you. Um, and maybe if you've been segmenting for years, I applaud you. I do know about the nonprofit spaces that some of you are uh, the best at segmenting lists. Um, but if you are not segmenting a list or you're not segmenting your lists enough, or if you're brand new to email marketing or you haven't started it, you want to segment your lists sooner than later. So let me define segmentation. Everybody's different, right? All of you are different from each other. I'm different than you. Um, Aretha is different than me. We're all different, right? We live in different locations. We have different passions. We have different interests and we take different actions. For each of your organizations, the segments that are important to you are going to be unique to you. But all of you, your constituency, your downline, your stakeholders, they're all different. And your mission is different. The way that you talk to people are different. And so the idea here is taking one big list and carving it up into smaller groups. Now, those groups might be demographic. They may be geographic. They may be based on activity. But what you want to do in email marketing to be successful is to take your big list and carve it up into smaller lists and to speak to people through email marketing with different information in different tones, with different calls to action. The example that I learned the hard way, now to be fair, this was over 12 years ago when I worked in the nonprofit and email marketing was relatively new. So I'll use that as an excuse. Some of you are going to yell at me, so I'm going to go ahead and say it. I was emailing my members. We were a membership-based organization. I was emailing my members, my non-members, and my vendors just one email with the exact same tone, with the exact same verbiage. Um, and after a couple of years of okay success with metrics and getting people to do what we want them to do, uh, came up with a brilliant idea. Like, <laughs> maybe we need to send out three emails, one to each different audience. And we immediately saw an uptake in, in, in donors and volunteers and membership renewals. Um, and the reason for that is I was asking my members to get a membership. Well, why would I do that, right? I was asking my members who were paying an annual fee to donate, which I means some of them actually did. But I wasn't speaking to my audiences uniquely. As soon as we segmented our list, we saw a lift in results. Much of the content was the same. I didn't need to change the content. Maybe an article here, maybe an article there. It was the tone. It was the way I was talking to them, um, the, the calls to action that I was using. 
that I needed to alter. So if you really want to be successful, the big secret sauce in email marketing is relevancy. The more relevant you can make the content, the more successful you're going to be. Now, when it comes to designing your email, make sure any email you send out, bulk email, email marketing, answers three specific questions. Firstly, what are you offering? So what is it that your email is all about? Secondly, how will it help the person receiving the email? And lastly, how are they going to do that? Now, this falls into the idea of making sure that any email marketing you put out is very, very easy for people to understand very, very quickly. The average email subscriber only spends about 20 seconds in an email. Well, that might sound intimidating, but I bet that's the same thing you do as well. The dirty little secret is we don't read anymore. We scan and we skim. And what we're doing is we're scanning what is it that I'm being asked or what is it that this email is about? What is it that I need to learn about it? And how do I do it? You want to make sure that your email falls into this very basic concept, right? Because we want people in the email and out of the email as quickly as possible. This is especially important for event marketing and donation marketing, right? So if we are trying to get people to take an action, we want to give them the quickest route possible to do that. Now, at this point, I guarantee you, Heather's about to receive questions. Heather's behind the scenes answering questions. Heather's probably receiving questions. Well, I send out a newsletter and we have a lot of content in there. Well, this comes back to the idea of segmentation. You want to make sure your email falls into some basic rules. Beyond just making sure that you have a headline, a message, and a body, you want to keep your email content to no more than about three images, no more than about 25 lines of text overall, and no more than three calls to action. A call to action simply means the link that they're going to click on and go do something. Why do we want to do that? Well, we want to keep that email as simple as possible. Why do we want them in and out of the email as quickly as possible? Well, the second that somebody clicks on a link in an email, they're already starting to think deeper. They're already thinking about attending or not attending, donating, not donating, reading, not reading. They're already more engaged than they were when they first got the email. So we're already closer to getting that donation than we were when they just opened the email. We're already closer to getting that volunteer, already closer to getting activity, uh, maybe registration for our event. This, the other reason we want that click is that tools like Constant Contact will tell you this person clicked on that link. And this is ultimately how you grow donations, especially from existing um, uh, people in your universe, people that you're already connected to an email that maybe never have donated. The reason for that is because Constant Contact reports who clicked on what. So what you do is that's another form of segmentation. I can collect a list of people that clicked on my donation list uh, link, my donation link, and compare it against recent donors. Let's say that Heather clicked on my donation link, but she never committed to donating. What might it be smart for me to do? Well, let's take a step back. What do we know about Heather? Well, she was obviously curious about donating, but she never made the next commitment. Hmm, I probably want to send her a follow-up email. And with a tool like Constant Contact, you can do that automatically. But that falls into a common concern I hear in the nonprofit space when, when it comes to email marketing. Well, I'm worried about sending too many emails. How many emails should I send? Well, I'm going to answer that question for you right now. The answer is, it depends. It really does. So you need to consider your audience, right? And this falls into segmentation. How many emails would I need to send them to cause the effect that I want? One thing I hear in the nonprofit space is not so much um, worried about oversending emails, over communicating. It's worry about people unsubscribing. That is a realistic concern. But the bigger concern is making sure that, in my opinion, the bigger concern is making sure your content is relevant. If your content is relevant, people will accept more emails. And so this falls back into segmentation because the more I can cut my audience into smaller groups, the more likely I'm going to send relevant content to them. We want to consider the expectations we set when we got our subscribers in the first place. So did you establish a relationship that you would send two emails a month or four emails a month or one email a month? One thing you can do in any kind of form, whether that's a form on your website or one of uh, lead generation forms like I showed you before, or even on the phone, if you're taking in somebody's email address, make sure you set the expectation that we generally send two emails a month. We might send a little bit more in November. We might send a little bit more around an event. But coming back to the idea of, I don't want to send too many emails, people will unsubscribe. Now, I get uh, a two emails a week from an organization, and I open every single one of them. And technically, they're a nonprofit. Wouldn't two emails a week sound like a high number? No, I open up every one. It's my, my child's high school. I open 
every one of their emails because I want to know what's going on in the school. That's because that's relevant to me. Now, do I think you can send two emails a week? No, I don't. But this is falls into the idea of relevancy. What we do want you to do is send, or what we do suggest you do, is send at least one email a month. Remember, email marketing is remarkably effective at building relationships and strengthening relationships. If you send less than once a month, you're losing mind share. If somebody signs up to your list, they're expecting an email probably pretty quickly. And in fact, the best practice is to send an email immediately. That's called a welcome email. And that is a piece of automation that can be found in Constant Contact. But they're right there. They signed up for your list. They're engaged as they're probably ever going to be. You want to make sure you're sending really regularly. Now, what I do see in the nonprofit space is that nonprofits ebb and flow with their email sends. Here in the States, you get really heavy around Giving Tuesday and then a couple of months dry up and then the next uh, donation campaign, the next uh, um, event that comes up and you get really heavy and then uh, it drops off. You want, you want to avoid that kind of staggered sending because basically you're priming the pump every single time you send. Now, the idea of people unsubscribing can be something legitimately uh, concerning, but the reality is somebody that's going to go through the, the steps to unsubscribe to you probably was never going to volunteer or donate or do anything with you. And so basically they're pruning your list for you. You want to pay attention to the active subscribers in your email database. What you want to make sure of is avoiding becoming irrelevant. That's the bigger danger. I guarantee you in your email inbox right now are emails from organizations that you have been passionate about, that you've donated to, that you've attended their events, or even for-profit organizations where you've spot, uh, uh, shopped and spent money that you just don't even see in your inbox anymore. You just don't even notice it. Why? Because at some point, they taught you that their email marketing was irrelevant. It didn't mean anything to your life. Not everyone you send to is going to donate the second you send an email. So it's really important or volunteer or attend an event or whatever you're asking them to do. So you want to stay top of mind. The way you do that is sending at least once a month. For nonprofits, the average good rhythm is going to be two emails a month. Stagger them every other week. Um, just make sure that that content is relevant in your segment. All right, so promotional emails. So you want to make sure that when you're doing something like an announcement, a, a, a reminder, a last chance reminder, that's when you can increase your frequency, as I said. So around events, maybe you do increase your send frequency for that event, but then you get back into that, that uh, twice a month rhythm. Now let's pivot to sending texts. You want to use text for exclusive and timely messages. So let's talk a little bit about text because text like email marketing is opt-in, is subscriber-based. You need to have permission to text people. So some do's around um, texting do ensure they opt in. You don't want to just pull out your phone and start texting people. That's that's going to just uh, end up really messy for you. You want to use a tool that actually has opt-in mechanisms. Surprise, surprise, Constant Contact does that. Um, you want to confirm their participation. So when they do opt in, you want to send them a text automatically confirming their automation. You want to include disclaimers, meaning you want to include legalese that talks about how often you're going to send, your send frequency, what hours you're going to send. And you want to set, set the expectations, how often you uh, can be expected to text them. You do not want to just add somebody to your text list just because you have their phone number. If we go back to that model I used before, who sends random texts to organizations who had no idea uh, from organizations, you have no idea who's sending this to you and why you got it. Well, that's a spammer, right? You don't want to act like a spammer. All right, some other do and don'ts when it comes to sending your message. Always give people the ability to opt out of that message. So if uh, you've ever gotten a text from a legitimate organization, usually like you see here at the bottom, there is an ability to unsubscribe. You want to do keep the door open for them to return. So a tool like Constant Contact allows people to resubscribe. If they opt out and then want to get back in, they can. You want to be mindful of the time. You want to send only between around 11 a.m. to 8 p.m. Eastern. The reason for that is that no one wants to get texts in personal hours. And you don't want to rely on area codes to decide when you're going to send a text. Now, we do see this a lot in nonprofits. So if you're a regional or very localized nonprofit, this may not matter. But if you have a broader range or you're living close on uh, uh, divergent time zones or you're national or international, you want to be mindful that area codes may not be the way you determine segmentation for when you send a text because people keep their phone numbers now. I live in Florida. I still have my Massachusetts area code. This is very, very common. Now, how do you grow your text list? That's generally what I hear most nonprofits talk about is, you know, they've been using social media for a while. Maybe they've been using email marketing for a while. They're very interested in SMS and text messages. They don't even know where to begin in terms of getting that permission. 
Well, getting permission for text marketing is very, very similar to the ways you would get permission for email marketing. So in person, so at um, if you have a brick and mortar, like, you know, if you have frontline staff, getting permission there. Anytime you're helping a stakeholder, somebody's on the phone, getting permission there. Certainly at events. So one thing you can employ is if you have an event registration page, include the ability for people to submit their phone number and have them opt in to get text from you. On flyer signage, so print material, any kind of print material, you want to offer people the ability to join your text list along with your email marketing list. And I'll give you an idea on how to do that uh, in a moment. And then obviously online. So on your website, on blogs, on social media, in that email signature line, landing pages, anywhere you're seen in the digital sphere, that's a fantastic place for you to grow your SMS list. Now, this should sound very familiar to something I talked about just a couple of minutes ago, because if we remember that lead generation uh, landing page, well, if you have SMS with Constant Contact, that page becomes a place for you to not just get email marketing uh, um, subscriptions, but text marketing subscriptions. So when you enable SMS and Constant Contact, you get this additional little window here where you can text, uh, and I would change that as a nonprofit, obviously. Um, I would uh, solicit for their text number, and then there's their legalese. We are gonna only send three emails a month. You can stop, uh, hit stop to end or help, uh, hit help for reply. You can see our terms and conditions. So we're setting those expectations right there. So if you're going to solicit for text messages, by the way, this is nearly the same thing for email marketing. You need to include what's in it for them. What would they receive? Now, that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to give discounts or anything. It just means setting that expectation. How many texts will they receive? And what might the text be about? Making sure that you're setting clear expectations for them. Clear expectations with them is going to mean that they're going to pay more attention and take action. Do remember to include disclaimers like your privacy policy and terms of service. As I said, that's already baked into the Constant Contact tool. Now, I respect that not all of you use Constant Contact. I would make sure that whatever tool you're using is offering, if they offer SMS, does have this baked in. One thing Constant Contact also provides is we have quiet hours built in. We have the from name built in for texting, and we have all the opt-in mechanisms to make sure that you're compliant and following these best practices. Now, when it comes to texting, you want to make sure that you identify yourself. When I talk about the from name, that's what you're seeing right here, okay? So you want to include the from name because that's what's going to immediately be seen in the text, and that's going to remind people, oh, yeah, I signed up for this, and I want to read this, right? The people that don't send a from name in a text are generally going to be spammers. Make sure your content is always timely and relevant. So you don't want to use texting um, as a stopgap tool with information that you would typically share in an email on social media. You've got to remember that in texting with SMS, it's got to be a very timely, very relevant message. You do want to stay consistent in your texting about once a month, right? So this is the same reason that you don't want to send too infrequently with email marketing. You need to keep that, that pump primed. If you send really, really staggered, people aren't going to pay attention to every text and some might actually uh, uh, unsubscribe or mark you as spam because they've forgotten how they're connected to you. Um, keep your content really short. You want to have no more than about 160 characters, including spaces and things like emojis. I know I'm sounding like a broken record, but Constant Contact SMS Solution does have a character count for you too, so you can keep your message short. Now, if you have the ability to, and I respect not all of you can, but if you have the ability to, try to make your text database feel like they're very exclusive because they are. Remember, this is the VIP party. So you want to try to be, oh, I skipped too fast. You want to try to be exclusive. Try to make it feel like it's something special if they're receiving text from you. Now, you have an inherent way to do that because somebody that donates to you is a very special person. Somebody who attends an event or registers for an event is a very, very special person. But you can bring that value, that exclusivity into your texting relationship. You can also try employing being personal. So Constant Contact does allow you to put somebody's first name in the text, which makes it feel like your content's written specifically for them. And try to be conversational. Think about what occurs on um, in your text inbox, right? It's typically going to be family members, friends, and coworkers texting to you, and it's usually very conversational. You want to kind of follow that model as well. Now, with email marketing and text marketing and social media marketing, you always want to be paying attention to the results. One thing I have learned in the nonprofit space is that nonprofits are typically very, very good at paying attention to the results. Why? Well, probably limited staff with a limited budget, so you want to make sure that you're getting the most effective value out of whatever you're doing. But if you're not paying attention to the metrics, you need to, and that's especially true in SMS. So you want to pay attention to the fact of, hey, is my SMS list growing? Yes, great. If not, I need to try some different ideas. You want to make sure that you're paying attention to how many clicks you're getting and how many conversations you're receiving in text, like how many people are responding back. 
um, uh, and conversions, not conversation, conversions, how, like, how many people are actually uh, donating to you uh, based on like if I sent out my text and it has a donate link on it today and I see an increase in donations tomorrow or Thursday, there's a correlation there. But you also want to be paying attention to your marketing metrics in email. So how many people open the email? How many people clicked on links in the email? And who specifically clicked on the links in the email? That's going to tell you more about what your audience likes and dislikes. When it comes to social media, you want to be there. You want to respond to your content. Pay attention to what content is really causing conversation in that social media space. If you have an article in your social media uh, profile and you're seeing more comments than usual, while well, your audience is telling you something, perhaps that content would be better, better repurposed a little bit for email marketing. Perhaps you can distill that down into a social, uh, into a text message. One thing that's really cool about these three platforms, these three channels, social media, email, and text, is that you can carve up your content into little pieces and share them uh, uniquely to that particular channel. Perhaps you take a little bit of content and you share it on your email and you say, hey, we have a broader conversation going on. Uh, I'm sorry, you, you share a little bit of content on social media. And then you say, hey, we're having a broader conversation in email. Why don't you join up uh, on our email list? And so you share that lead generation landing page. And then in your email, you say, hey, we are going to be sharing out a thought leadership piece on SMS. Click here to join our SMS list. You can carve up your, your marketing in a variety of ways like this. Maybe you start with text and you drive people to uh, email. I'm going to share an example of that next. So how do we create an overall great experience? So you want to use your, your channels in concert. And so I just talked to you about how you can carve up your marketing into different pieces. Constant Contact did just that. About a year ago, we launched our SMS tool. And we actually started months before. We started months before on social media. And we were engaging people in conversations about text marketing. Now, that was doing two different things. One, we were learning more about how our customers think and how we should communicate to them around texting and what they found valuable and what they found um, could be left behind. And then we crafted that into our marketing. When we launched SMS, we crafted it into our marketing. We crafted it into our tool. On email, we got more defined. So we talked not just specifically about the fact that we're launching SMS, but really how to have the best experience with it and, and leverage best practices. So that's where we promoted something like a webinar, which is what you're seeing here. And then we used text for media and information. So we reminded people that the, the, the webinar was about to occur. You can take one concept like this, launching an SMS tool, and broaden it across your different channels to communicate more deeply in the way that those channels are best utilized. Regardless of what you do, regardless of what platform you use, you need to understand the ecosystem of increasing word of mouth and increasing uh, activity with your organization. So I like to think of this as a big cycle. So here's your nonprofit. So it, of course, starts with building a quality experience. Now, this is going to be par for the course for nonprofits. You, you know that you're doing something great in the world. You know that you're affecting people's lives. A positive experience is probably based, baked right into your DNA. And that also helps you enticing people to stay in touch. Now, one thing you need to make sure is if you're providing a quality experience, if you're doing something really great and, and it's very obvious, make sure you're consistently asking people to join you on social, join your email marketing list, join you on SMS text marketing. And you need to regularly engage with them. So another place where nonprofits tend to fall is that they're not regularly engaging across all the channels. You want to make sure that you're following a consistent send schedule for email. And if you're employing SMS, a consistent uh, text schedule there. That can help you also drive social visibility. So if they're following you on text, you can encourage them to also connect to you on social media. If they're following you on email, they can encourage them to follow you on social media. So we're increasing our exposure because one thing about social with email marketing, you're just hitting my inbox. With text messaging, you're just hitting my text inbox. Social media is visible to the world. So you want to encourage people to connect you on social media um, that are following you just on email, that are just following you through SMS, because that's going to be more visible. That's going to increase your exposure because you're going to have people on social media making comments, liking uh, um, uh, your social media posts. Well, that's visible to their friends and their family and their stakeholders. And so you're increasing the number of people seeing your marketing. And that elect, allows you to connect to new pro uh, prospects, which drive them into your nonprofit ecosystem and we just keep going, rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat, and rinse and repeat. So ideally, there's been lots of questions in the background. Heather, warning, we're about to get to the Q&A portion. I want to review what we talked about today. So we talked about how you can own the smartphone. So you want to use social media for awareness engagement. You want to use email marketing to deepen and strengthen relationship. And you want to use text for exclusive and timely messages. So if we take our action plan, what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring up that idea of challenges and remind you that your action plan post-webinar is 
Focus on retaining existence and stakeholders first and foremost. They are the most valuable asset you have in your organization beyond your fantastic staff and volunteers. Um, these are people that uh, are committed to you and we wanna make sure we're doing things, communicating with them regularly, staying top of mind so that we retain them and have them connected to us for a long time because they're not only going to donate in the future again, they're not only gonna volunteer again, they're not gonna do, uh, uh, interact with you again, but they can actually introduce you to other potential stakeholders. Number two, that's where you wanna find new donors. And these two things are connected. Again, if we're doing a good job here, they're going to help us grow here. Now that's not gonna be the exclusive way you're gonna grow, but that's one really big piece of your strategy. And lastly, focus on spending your time where it's most valuable, pay attention to your reporting and your analytics and use tools that make it very easy for you to leverage your time. Now I would not be doing my job as an employee of Constant Contact if I didn't tell you, hey, Constant Contact is a fantastic way for you to do all of these initiatives. And in terms of saving time, we have uh, thousands of integration integrations that connect to Constant Contact that will save you time. And one of our very favorite in the world is very popular in the nonprofit space, DonorPerfect, a fantastic tool that helps you segment your donor database. And that syncs directly into Constant Contact, saving you time and helping you keep your content as relevant as possible. Now, before I get to the questions, if you're not a Constant Contact customer, you can sign up today, get 50% off. 50% off the lifetime of your subscription. You do need to go through TechSoup um, uh, first, and then you'll uh, have the chance to get that discount. Um, but I encourage you that if you're not leveraging these three powerful tools through full effectiveness, email marketing, social media marketing, and text marketing, to take constant contact, uh, uh, give us a look. Now, one thing I do want to say, because we strive to be transparent, is that email marketing and social media marketing obviously are included amongst many other tools of constant contact. Text marketing carries an additional add-on fee because of the unique nature of texting. So I didn't want you to feel like I bait and switched you. All right, Heather, here we go. What questions do we have? Okay, wow, that was really wonderful. Um, there's some great comments in the chat. Um, on the content and everybody's really appreciative. Um, there are a couple of questions um, regarding demographics of email. Mm -hmm. So Beth and G, um, they had a question on demographics of um, who uses email. They're wondering if the younger groups are using other platforms um, or what kind of uh, feedback would you have on that? I do have an article that I can share in terms of um, email marketing statistics. Um, but just wanted to throw it out there. Would they be using different channels? Uh, you just mm -hmm. went through a couple of different channels um, to reach different audiences. Uh, I think I think I think you said a, the name was Beth. Yeah, Beth. I, I think Beth already knows the answer to that question, um, mm -hmm. as many of you do. Yeah, of course. Not everybody is going to be on the same platform, and and generally younger people are going to skew towards social and especially text. But I'm, I'm going to argue a little bit, and I haven't seen this article, Heather, but I'd be willing to bet the article probably points on this too. You can't segment people that broadly, right? Not every person in the younger generation is going to only be using text, and not every person in an older generation is only going to be using email. Um, and this is very personal, and I'm just going to share it as a storytelling technique. But uh, my dad texts me every day. He uses text. Um, I really can't get him to pay attention to email. Uh, he's on social media a lot. Now, is he an example of every person um, that's a baby boomer? No, but you can't and shouldn't put all of your eggs in one basket and make assumptions. That's why we encourage uh, all organizations to think cross-channel, to think making sure you're communicating as broadly as possible. And that goes back into that party principle. You want to be careful in ignoring one platform, one channel, because you assume your audience isn't there. Make sure though, that as I said, you're talking through each channel in the way that's best uh, for that channel. Um, so I would not use this exact same content. When I say content, I mean literally word for word in a text that I would use in an email. And I wouldn't use the same word for word, copy and paste kind of content from email and social media. Make sure you're speaking to each audience um, in the way that the tool requires. Awesome. Um, there was a follow-up question uh, from Ascension, and they had um, they had suggested that they agree with the demographic aspect, and with the older perisher group, sometimes I find a good old-fashioned handwritten note 
by snail mail is the most appreciated. That probably speaks to their comfort level um, with social media as well. So any words of um, advice on encouraging to use some of these digital platforms as complimenting? Uh, I would compliment it, yeah. We, you know, I, uh, we used to send snail mail pieces with my nonprofit and we sometimes send snail mail pieces at Constant Contact. Snail mail, you know, and I'm not going to, I'm mean, not going to throw that under the bus either. Like snail mail is really can be very effective. The problem with snail mail is the trackability, the lack of trackability. Is that a good ex expense? Um, you don't know that it was delivered. You don't know that it was read. You don't know that they found it of value. Now, eventually, if they do donate a 10, you can maybe correlate that to your snail mail. Um, but I would encourage, again, cross channel. You know, um, snail mail doesn't make sense for some of you. Some of you, it does. What I would do is make sure that you're sharing similar messaging on other channels. So snail mail is just considered another channel. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so in the Q&A, um, Marsha had asked, uh, every week we send an email telling who is speaking on Sundays with a picture of the minister, mm -hmm. the musician, the um prayer ministry, and then what's coming up for the week. We've never segmented um, and not knowing how or what it is and how to apply to our congregation. How would you recommend um, to send a short and simple email weekly based off of that information? Sure. So with religious organizations, you have a little wider room to play. Um, I don't necessarily think immediately that segmentation would be necessary based on what you just told me, Marcia. Um, what you, what a natural segmentation, I'm going to go on assumptions here, a natural segmentation would be uh, maybe a generalized email to uh, the, the bulk of the parishioners, but then youth-oriented marketing towards your younger uh, congregants, and uh, maybe something around um, uh, unique offerings that you have for older congregants, parishioners. Um, that's the kind of segment I generally see in religious organizations. Um, but let me pivot to the second part of the question, because I think this would be applicable to all of you. One thing uh, we see in the nonprofit space, well, two things we see in the nonprofit space. One is a lack of resources in the sense, the lack of ability to quickly update websites. Uh, and that may be because of a lack of infrastructure or a lack of time. And so we'll generally get pushback from nonprofits that, well, I have to share a really long article in my email because I have nowhere else to, to put it. You say, I'll you know, keep it down to 25 uh, lines of text. How am I going to do that? Well, there's a couple of pieces of strategy. One is with a tool like Constant Contact, you can have people, instead of clicking on a button to go to a website, they can click on a button and get a download. That's one thing you can do. But another thing you can do is leverage a, a included service in Constant Contact, which is landing pages. So you can create these little one-page mini websites, and you can link to that one-page little mini website. Um, in your email. And so perhaps you just have a little bit of that, and I'm going to sort of use Marsha's example again, of the biography of the speaker. Maybe you just have a few sentences about it and say, click here to read the full biography. And it goes to a lovely page where you've created with their, their headshot and a long biography, and you can share a lot more information. Um, those of you that use Constant Contact, if you've not gone to the little create button and, and gone to landing pages, you might be missing out on a tool that can help you make your emails not just shorter, but far more dry, uh, dynamic because you can share things like video, Video, and you can put in a lot of content in a landing page. Um, obviously, the best place for you to link to is your website. But if you can't, or in there's situations where you shouldn't, use a landing page. Awesome. Um, and then just a follow-up question for that. Um, I think you already answered this question, uh, but Vic, Vic asked, are organization web pages old technology, or can we use that as a key role in our messaging? So kind of build off of what you just said. Our organization's web page, oh no, no, you want traffic to your web page. Now, when it comes to web pages, especially in the nonprofit space, you want to make sure that you're consistently keeping it up to date. One thing nonprofits will do is they'll buy a website, they'll get their general information out, and then it's just never updated. Um, you could be seeding money uh, to uh, that you should be receiving if you're not regularly updating it. Um, you want to be paying attention to search engine optimization. And one thing that you can do, a very simple way that you can increase the chances of somebody finding you on uh, social media, uh, on search engines, is making sure you're putting regular content. One way that nonprofits can do that regularly is through a blog. Um, and the benefit of a blog is you could, let's, let's go back to our email for a second. And social media and texting. Um, you know, one thing nonprofits can do is if you create a blog and you write content for a blog, well, boom, there's content for your social. Boom, there's content for your email, and potentially, boom, there's content for your for your um, 
your text messaging. Um, if you start with a blog too, that's going to keep your content refreshed and new on your website, and it's going to increase the visibility you'll have. Um, it, no, you generally want to drive people to your website. There's just organizations that may not be able to um, update their content regularly enough, or it's just not an investment that they're willing to make. But generally, we suggest all organizations, nonprofits and force, the first place you start is a website. Awesome, wonderful advice. Um, okay, so this one's a little bit of a technical question um, and I can pop a, a knowledge base article in um, the chat, but Regina had asked, can the constant contact brand name be hidden on emails for a more personal approach? They can. Um, you would wanna contact our support line and, and Heather said she's gonna share an article on how to do that. Um, there is a fee associated with that. It's a one-time fee um, and we'll, we'll pull that out. We can even for a one-time fee, um, change what's on the footer. So you could have a, your logo and some verbiage that you want down there. What we will not do is remove the unsubscribe link. We'll never do that. Awesome. And then unless we have any more questions come into the chat, um, I do have one last question in the Q&A from Miko. Uh, what would that look like as a wor workflow with a text, email, social, and website? I would, as I said, I'd start with websites. So start with your content on your website if you have the ability to. Um, and then I would actually kind of do all three in concert. So I'm going to sound like a real constant contact salesperson. I, I'm here for a reason. But I mean, we offer all these tools in constant contact, all in one username and password. So what I would do is um, generally you want to start with your website content, and then you're going to take that content. You're going to put some of it in your email, and you're going to add a link to that website content. Now, there's reasons you don't want to have it on your website or can't have it on your website. Then you start an email. You build up your content there, and then you use some of that content in your social media. So one thing you can do with Constant Contact is you can synchronize. So when you're sending the email, you can actually have it also share on social media but you can actually have a slightly different message. Remember how we talked about speaking to people in different voices across different channels. And so you can literally repurpose your email content, same images, same headlines in a social media post and have it look different, not just for social media, but look different for Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. So you can have each one look different. Then I would think about texting. The hardest one for me to connect the dots for on this question is texting, because again, texting is gonna be slightly different animal. We wanna be thinking about relevancy and timely information. So if the email content, what you're putting on the web is time oriented, especially in nonprofit space gonna be around an event then sure, you can repurpose that content on, on um, SMS. One thing you want to consider if you have the ability to do it as a nonprofit, some of you can and some of you can't, is if you're going to follow this model, this, this workflow and social media, I'm sorry, SMS texting is at the end of that flow. Um, you can also look at your content and say, well, how can I save a little piece of this as an exclusive? Like you're going to get this thought leadership piece or this white paper SMS folks. Um, or if you're not wanting to go in a text, maybe you keep it just for your email marketing folks. Um, try to think of exclusivity and how I can make that content feel really, really exclusive. One other piece of transparency I need to apply because I do know that one person said they're from Canada is the constant context text solution is US only at the current time. So I don't want you to go into constant contact and go, oh, Matt didn't tell me this. And, uh, uh, we are only U.S. based right now. Wonderful. Well, we are almost at the top of the hour, and I think we've answered all of the questions. Um, so I think we can go ahead and wrap it up unless anybody has any um, additional questions. I did. There was uh, some requests for the URL. Um, some people were watching on their smartphone. Um, so look at them being super savvy. Uh, so we had popped the link in the chat, and then we will also follow up um, with that URL in our post uh, follow-up communications. Um, and you can also go to TechSoup and just search for Constant Contact. We have um, a listing on TechSoup's um, website, and that's how you will get started. So TechSoup, um, you'll go through their, their process, and once you go through their process, you will be able to access the 50% off discount um, for for constant contact. So um, thank you very much, Matthew. Wow, that was really great information. Um, and there's just one last question. How long is this deal available? So the deal of it is available because of the partnership with constant contact and TechSoup. Um, so it does not expire. Uh, you will get the 50% off on a monthly basis. 
Um, so just head over to TechSoup, head over to that link, head over to that QR code. Um, and then, yes, like I said, we'll uh, follow up with an email with all of the information that we shared. We'll share the recording. We'll share um, some additional blog articles and some resources and the presentation. Uh, so with that, I'll say thank you from Constant Contact, but I'll throw it over to you, uh, Matthew, if you have any additional uh, parting words. I just thank you, Heather, for uh, for being uh, in the background there, uh, tackling those questions. And thank all of you. Um, as I said at the top, I'm extraordinarily passionate about nonprofits. I definitely want to see all Constant Contact customers succeed, but I have a special place in my heart for nonprofits. Um, and I thank you for taking your valuable time out to, to listen to me for a little while, and hopefully we assisted you in some way. Everybody have a fantastic day, and hopefully we'll see you next time. Thank you.